In the early months of 1995, the construction of an underground bunker was completed in Vyatsky Polany, within the Kirov region of Russia. This project was the brainchild of Alexander Komin, who, alongside his accomplice, Alexander Mikhaev, spent four years building this, hidden below a garage. Komin's heinous scheme involved forcing women into slave labor within the confines of this bunker, in which they were also held as prisoners for years at a time. Motivated by a desire to get rich through the exploitation of his captives, Komin's vile aspirations extended beyond mere financial gain. He envisaged creating an insidious underground kingdom. In this dark realm, enslaved women would be forced to give birth to his offspring, giving rise to successive generations of slaves all bound to serve and idolize him as their ruler. A truly perverse vision. This case is truly shocking. It's one that's bleak, twisted and cruel. I'm going to give you a warning now. This is a rough one. But before we dive in, I want to let you know about my second channel called Grim Tales where I'm covering true crime stories that are shocking but not murderous. I think if you find this content interesting, then you should see what's over there. Link to the channel is in the comments. Don't forget to like this video if you want to see my next one. It really helps me out. Thank you. This video is created solely for educational and documentary purposes. It does not endorse or condone the criminal actions described within. Alexander Komin was born on July 15, 1953, in the town of Polyani, during the era of the Soviet Union. He was brought up in a middle-class household, nestled within a working-class district. Komin's life was unremarkable and calm. He was a student of average academic performance, not particularly standing out in any particular subject, and his discipline was in check. Upon completing eighth grade, Komin abandoned his studies, driven by a desire to enlist in the military. He seen no further value in formal education and had been disillusioned for some time. He dropped out of high school and started the military enrollment process. Komin successfully passed the required examinations and was poised to begin his career in the military. However, on the cusp of joining, he got into a violent altercation with two men, inflicting serious harm upon them. This incident led to his incarceration at the tender age of 18 serving a three-year sentence and abruptly derailing his plans. During his incarceration, Komin discovered a passion for tailoring while working in the colony's sewing factory. The process of sewing and creating garments captivated him to such an extent that upon his release, he was determined to further his education in textile manufacturing. Meanwhile, stories being told by fellow inmates enriched Komin's understanding of the world, but unfortunately not for the good. A story he found particularly intriguing came from his cellmate, who was incarcerated for the abduction of several homeless individuals. He told Komin how he forced those people into painting artworks of famous landmarks and selling them for himself. The manipulation of power to amass wealth left a profound impact on Komin. He saw for the first time a man who exercised unlimited power over others and wanted to experience this himself. Once free, he immediately pursued his calling enrolling in a technical college and earning a diploma in fashion design and tailoring. Despite his dedication and newly acquired skills, 
the grim economic climate of his hometown meant that his qualifications could not gain him employment. Komen instead worked various jobs, including roles as an electrician, a security guard, and a firefighter. It was during one of these positions, on a night shift, that he encountered Alexander Mikiev, an engineer who was also struggling, both professionally and financially. Amidst this hardship, Komen's thoughts often drifted back to the story told by his former cellmate, the man who had enslaved homeless people and forced them into labor for his own personal gain. Inspired by this, Komen shared with Mikiev his own entrepreneurial but morally reprehensible ideas. One was to force people to grow berries and vegetables in a greenhouse, for them both to sell at market. The other, more sinister plan, involved farming animals for their fur. Shockingly, Mikiev agreed to Komin's horrific plan. United by their dire situations and a shared lack of morality, the two men began laying the groundwork for what they called the Greenhouse Project. Komin had his own garage, number 198, in a small row of private garages. This was the place they planned to make the greenhouse and keep their slaves. The two Alexanders soon realized the dangers of confining people in a garage. Any cries for help would attract unwanted attention. To reduce this risk, they opted to construct a secret basement beneath the garage, effectively transforming it into a bunker. The construction of this concealed space took four years, during which the duo were occasionally observed by neighboring garage owners, transporting soil and construction materials. Komin deflected suspicion by claiming he was growing vegetables within his garage. To maintain the facade and avoid raising suspicions, the pair moved their supplies mostly under the cover of night. Meanwhile, as the bunker took shape, Komin's original business concept evolved. He began to ominously refer to the structure not as a greenhouse, but as a dungeon. Ultimately, he envisioned the space as a textile factory, an establishment far from its seemingly innocuous beginnings. As the year 1994 came to a close, this haunting facility was finalized beneath the earth, its chambers reaching depths of eight to nine meters, all veiled beneath the guise of a mundane garage. Ladders rigged with a lethal 220 volt charge were the only entry point and served as a grim deterrent against the escape of those who would soon be ensnared. To further silence any cries for help, triple doors were put in place, each a barrier to the outside world. The bunker's walls were covered in mattresses to absorb sound with a suffocating effect. This makeshift factory was now set with an array of sewing machines and work tables, mimicking that of a small factory. With their grotesque fortress ready, Komin and Makiev embarked on a harrowing prowl, hunting for women to drag into their nightmarish enterprise. The duo devised a profile for their prey, women who were reclusive, estranged from their family, seeking employment, and who wouldn't be immediately missed. They were essentially looking for lost souls, people they felt they could easily manipulate. They walked around the city for weeks, hanging around train stations and marketplaces, looking for those who matched their specifications. On a fateful day, January 13th, 1995, a chance encounter brought together Alexander Komin and 33-year-old Vera Talpaeva. 
who simply asked him for a cigarette. A casual conversation began, leading Comin to invite Vera for a drink in his garage to celebrate the old new year. In this area of Russia, it was normal to invite people to places like a garage for a drink. So Vera thought nothing of this and was delighted to accept. That evening, Komin and Mikiev were drinking and joking with Vera. Things seemed to be going well, but then Komin slipped a substance into Vera's drink. It quickly took effect and she lost consciousness. She awoke a few hours later, deep inside the bunker. Here, the cruel revelation was thrust upon her. It was in no uncertain terms, explained to her that she was now a captive, condemned to work as a seamstress in this prison. She was warned that resistance would be met with brutality, essaying, starvation, and even death. Vera had no option but to submit to them. Outside, Vera's family did report her missing, but despite the efforts of the police, they assumed that she was just another runaway, which was not uncommon. Vera was now trapped there, with no one looking for her. Terrifying. Komin began to teach Vera how to use the sewing machine, along with other skills required for production of garments to be sold. However, despite Komin's best efforts, Vera was simply not up to the task. Her hands perhaps trembling with fear, but she could not meet the standards required. Frustration grew with Komin and Mikiev as time wore on. The fear that their heinous plan might unravel before it even truly began was eating away at them. Komin, however, came up with another plan. He demanded Vera give him the name of someone who was good at sewing and tailoring. Under the weight of his immense pressure, Vera suggested an acquaintance of hers, who was a skilled dressmaker. Her name was Tatiana Melinkova, a 35-year-old woman. Vera did not know the exact address for Melinkova. She could only offer the name of the street she lived on. But this did not deter Komin, as he set out, scouring the street, looking into the houses for any sign of the woman who matched Melinkova's description. In a dark twist of fate, on the very same street, Komin bumped into a man called Nikolai Malik, a fellow inmate during his time in prison. They got chatting, and it turned out Malik lived on that street as well. He lived with his girlfriend, who just happened to be none other than Tatiana Melinkova. Komin could not believe his luck. Seizing the opportunity, Komin approached with a friendly facade, inviting them both for a casual drink, a gesture Malik was more than happy to partake in. The couple, unsuspecting, joined Komin for what appeared to be a harmless gathering. As the evening progressed, the conversation flowed, but then Komin secretly administered the same substance into their drinks, and quickly the paralyzing grip took hold, and in no time they were both unconscious. Melinkova was taken down into the bunker. Meanwhile, Malik proved to be an issue. Komin knew Malik had a strong, aggressive personality. There was an understanding that Malik would never willingly submit to their will. He posed a threat to their plans. Komin and Mikiev, resorting to their usual macabre tactics, stripped Malik of his clothing and abandoned him in a desolate winter field where the harsh elements guaranteed no survival. They dumped Malik's clothes nearby, hoping to lead the police astray. The psychological response to extreme cold can sometimes make individuals remove their clothing as they feel overheated, a symptom of hypothermia. 
when Malik's body was eventually discovered. The clothes nearby his remains led the authorities to conclude that he had succumbed to the natural, albeit tragic, consequences of exposure. Rather than foul play, they believed that whilst he was intoxicated, he got lost in the snow and eventually froze to death. Komin and Mikiev had just gotten away with murder. Melinkova's family reported her disappearance, but as in Vera's case, the investigation went nowhere. It appeared to the officers like the women had just vanished. I suppose there was no way for them to know that they were being enslaved in a bunker. Melinkova was forced to work 16 hour days. She made dressing gowns, underwear and had to finish at least 32 bathrobes each day. This was grueling work. Vera could not help with the production of the garments. So instead, she helped Melinkova with everything she needed and kept the bunker clean. The men also used her body to pleasure themselves. Although they forced themselves on both the women, it was seen more as Vera's job to do so more often. Vera and Melinkova were tormented by death threats and were fed menial food like potatoes, bread and water. Sometimes the women would not even get this and would be starved for days. They would resort to frying potato skins to get something extra into their diet. They were only allowed to bathe once a week with a bucket of water to share between them and the beatings and essaying continued. While they were suffering through all this, Komin and Mikiev found a market for their illicit garments. With demand for their production steadily growing, the profits began to flow in and the two men began to consider expanding their dark enterprise. Realizing the need for additional labor, this time they set their sights on abducting a man to enslave, searching for a suitable candidate to ensnare into their operation. His search led him to a liquor store where he encountered Yevny Shishov, a 37-year-old homeless man who had been struggling with alcoholism and had fallen on hard times. Despite his predicaments, Shishov used to be in the Air Force. He was fit, strong, and in Komin's eyes, ideal for labor. Komin sought to capitalize on Shishov's desperation. He was a man who would willingly exchange his freedom for basic sustenance and shelter. Shishov consented to being a captive and work in the bunker under the promise of being fed and housed. This agreement was a harrowing insight into the despair in which Shishov found himself. Komin trained Shishov in how to operate the sewing machines, laying out expectations of the grueling work ahead. But again, like Vera, he simply did not meet the standards. Komin was not sure what to do about the situation. Shishov knew about the bunker. He knew about the plight of the other women. He couldn't just let him go. However, the situation took an unexpected turn when Shishov, in an effort to demonstrate his usefulness, revealed that he was a trained electrician. This revelation set off an alarm in Komin's mind. With expertise in electronics, Shishov posed a significant risk. He had the capability to disable the power to the electrified ladders, which could lead to the escape of all the captives. This new information presented a significant complication for Komin, and one he could not overlook. Komin made the grim decision that Shishov had to die. His fate was sealed. Komin pieced together a crude electric chair fixing bare wires to Shishov's arms and legs. He was then granted one final cigarette before Komin commanded Melankova and Vera to deliver the fatal shock by switching on the charge. Melankova refused to comply 
unwilling to cross the line into murder. Vera, however, complied and Shishov was killed instantly. Komin disposed of Shishov's body in a deserted forest when his remains were eventually found. His known alcoholism led authorities to attribute his death to accidental poisoning with no further inquiries. After this, Komin turned on Melankova with ferocious violence for her defiance. While showing favor towards Vera, he eventually began to trust Vera. This built up so much that she was actually able to leave the bunker. Komin knew that she would not run away, but comply and assist in bringing another unsuspecting individual into the bunker. Despite the opportunity to seek help, the psychological toll and fear instilled by Komin kept Vera from approaching the police. She tragically became an instrument in the continuation of their heinous cycle. On July 16th, 1995, 36-year-old Tatiana Kuzikova found herself in the bunker's grim confines. Despite holding a job, her wages were unreliable and a moment of desperation had driven her to steal a cake for her daughter's birthday, an act that now laid heavy on her with an upcoming court hearing and the threat of possible incarceration. When Vera, under the manipulation of her enslavement, presented the offer of a job opportunity, Kuzikova, hoping to pay her way out of legal troubles, quickly accepted. She was desperate, but what she didn't know was that she was being led into the depths of Komin's sinister lair. Kuzikova's spirit, however, proved formidable. The bunker's harrowing conditions, Komin's physical abuse, and his violent essaying did not kill her will. Her defiance was strong. She fought back against her captive. She even protected Melankova, who was teetering on the brink of despair by this point. She was even considering ending it all. Kuzikova, with her bright spirit, crafted a homemade amulet for Melankova as a beacon of hope and inscribed phrases of encouragement wherever she could around the bunker, promising freedom would one day be theirs. Her determination was fueled by the love for her daughter and the unwavering belief that she would one day see her again. Kuzikova meticulously observed the bunker's layout, looking for any weaknesses. She noticed the electrified ladders and she tried to find a way to cut the power to them. Failing in this, what she did notice, that each time Komin entered, he would disable the electrical system unknowingly presenting them with a chance to escape. And seizing this moment, Kuzikova managed to trap Komin in a room, barricading the door with various objects. In a desperate bid for freedom, she and Melankova attempted to flee, but their hopes were quickly dashed as Komin, fueled by rage, burst open the door and grabbed both women. The punishment he handed out was brutal and ferocious, leaving him spattered in blood from the violence he inflicted. The ordeal escalated as he resorted to using a hose and strangling Kuzikova with it, choking her and then burning her hands with the flame of a large candle. The cruelty they both endured was horrific and shown the inhumanity of their captor. Komin presented the women with a harrowing ultimatum for punishment. They were to choose between having their mouths grotesquely slashed from ear to ear, like a Chelsea smile, or being branded with a tattoo of the word Pax, a Russian term signifying slave, etched onto their faces. Faced with this cruel choice, the women opted for the tattoo, a permanent reminder of their captivity but one that spared them from further physical mutilation. Komin tattooed the phrase on their foreheads and under their eyes. To stop any further attempts of escape, Komin resorted to even more extreme measures. He fastened welded shackles 
to the bunker's walls, and each time before coming down the ladder, he would send a signal using a lamp. This was the woman's cue to lock the shackles around their own necks, wrists and ankles, and to leave the keys in plain sight, ensuring their complete helplessness. Under these horrific conditions, the production of garments continued relentlessly. Melenkova laboured to the point of exhaustion, barely sleeping or eating. On one occasion, the demand was huge. Komen forced her to make 32 dresses within a single day. Vera, meanwhile, remained complicit, aiding in the hunt for new victims to sustain their grim operation. But then, unexpectedly, Vera vanished and did not return. Komen felt confident that the terror he had instilled in Vera was enough to silence her forever. He believed that no matter where she fled, she wouldn't dare expose him, so he made no effort to pursue her. His assumption proved correct. Vera chose not to reveal the horrors she had endured. She attempted to disappear into a new life, leaving the other captives alone to face the brutalities without any hope of being rescued. With Vera now gone, Komin and Mikiev spoke again about what to do, and as usual, the plan was to search for more captives. Komin set his sights on markets and train stations again, and in early 1996, he encountered a young woman who fit his vile criteria. She was shy, had a nice figure, and looked desperate. Komin engaged her in conversation, lured her to his garage with the promise of food and a place to rest, and, most importantly, employment. His method was ruthless and familiar, a drink laced with substances, followed by abduction to the bunker. The latest victim of his horrific plan was 27-year-old Tatiana Nazim, who, unbeknownst to Komin, was struggling mentally, having fled her home years prior due to her issues with it. Despite his efforts to train her on the sewing machines and garment making, Nazim lacked the skill and mental ability for tailoring. Komin did have some use for her still. She was relegated to the role of intimate mistress, a further indignity amidst her captivity. She would have to pleasure Komin and Mikiev at their will, replacing the role of the missing Vera. Meanwhile, the garments were selling well on the market. Demand was high, and Komin and Mikiev began to eye an expansion into new territories. They forced the captives to craft robes for priests and other religious garments. They produced large, intricate flags and items intended for public institutions like the police. However, these entities, citing budget constraints, declined the purchase of these products. But Komin and Mikiev were now making money from the forced labor of others, and expansion was on their minds. They constructed a cucumber farm, equipping it with heating for year-round cultivation, and forced their captives into farming the crops. Before long, a bountiful harvest grew, which fetched a good profit for the duo. Again, they then expanded into including potatoes. However, production hit a snag when the occupant of a neighboring garage raised complaints about the excessive heat, which had become too much to bear. Alarmed by the risk of discovery, Komin and Mikiev ended their operation immediately, and back to the bunker and making garments it was. Komin, whilst wandering the markets, bumped into Vera. He pretended to be happy to see her again, and offered to give her a share in the factory's profits, if she became his partner and kept the bunker a secret. Vera agreed, and even offered to bring a new slave to show her loyalty. This new person was 22-year-old Irina Ganushkina. She had been looking for flats to move into with her boyfriend. She had gone to a viewing alone, and this is when she met Vera, who was leasing the flat 
on behalf of the landlord, Irina, a young mother, seeking a better life for herself and her daughter, who was being cared for by relatives. She was in desperate need of work. Her limited education and lack of experience had hindered her job search. Vera exploited her vulnerability, offering her a connection to a potential employer, and she then gave her a drink with the mixed substance, and quickly, Irina passed out. Vera called Komin, and together they took her to the bunker. When Irina awoke, a few hours later, she was terrified by the situation, but was relieved to see Mikiev, who she knew growing up. She thought she was going to be saved. She asked Mikiev for help, but he refused and instead essayed her. It's difficult to imagine how Irana must have felt after this happened. This is one of the most harrowing situations I have come across. Komin's encounter with Vera in the marketplace was not genuine. After introducing Irina to the horrors of the bunker, Komin set out to seek revenge on Vera. He had no intention of sharing profits. His true aim was to make an example of her, to instill fear amongst other captives. Komin tied Vera to the table with which the garments were usually made on, silenced her with a gag and began to thrust needles beneath her fingernails. The agony was so intense that Vera lost consciousness. Komin then tried to force Melankova to finish the vile act by injecting Vera with antifreeze. Melankova did not want to, but feared the repercussions if she did not comply. But Vera, in a final act of defiance, and to prevent Melankova from becoming a murderer, chose to drink the antifreeze herself sparing the other women from the burden of murder. Vera's death lasted a grueling 15 hours of pure pain as the poison passed through her body. Once she had died, Komin and Mikiev simply disposed of her in a nearby river. By March 1997, Tatiana Nazim's condition deteriorated. Symptoms of her mental illness, alongside leukemia, made her become gravely ill. Nazim needed a lot of professional care, and Komin deemed her a liability. The other captives pleaded for her release to seek hospital treatment, arguing that given her state, she would not be credible if she spoke out. Komin tested Nazim's grasp on reality, questioning her identity and her understanding of her circumstances. In her response, she identified herself as a student living in an intensive dressmaking course led by Alexander Komin. This sealed her fate in his eyes. He considered her a major risk, so he starved her for days before cruelly ending her with injections of antifreeze. Nazim's remains were eventually discovered, and while her family was notified, her life on the streets led authorities to conclude her death was a result of her untreated conditions, and no further investigation ensued. Back in the bunker, Komin's interest in Irina grew into a twisted romance. She was young, and appeared compliant, traits that appealed to him. Following Nazim's death, Komin held a celebration within the bunker, indulging in sweet treats in an attempt to woo Irina. This had obviously never happened before. Irina was terrified by the situation, but soon she faced a crucial decision. When Komin left, the other women urged her to reciprocate Komin's advances. They saw it as a strategy for survival and a good chance to escape. Irina played her part convincingly, penning poems that Komin, in his delusion, believed were written for him. Her words were actually written for her boyfriend back home. But when Komin read them, it moved him to tears. He fell deeply in love with Irina. Komin 
now under Arena's influence, revealed his grandiose and depraved vision for the future, an underground kingdom of enslaved women forced to bear his children. He envisioned Arena as his official wife and made several attempts to conceive a child with her, resorting to grotesque methods like artificial insemination with turkey basters when natural methods failed. Irina, using her influence over Komin, persuaded him that the bunker's conditions were not a good place to conceive and that they should try elsewhere. Irina said, Almost immediately, he explained his feelings to me. He said he wanted to marry me. In return, I asked that there be no more harassment of other women, even if they don't meet his expectations with work. He started bringing us normal food. He asked Tatiana to make me a beautiful dress. I didn't have my own clothes. He took me upstairs to breathe fresh air. However, he immediately warned me that there was no point in shouting. No one would hear me anyway. I decided I would play along. I had to pretend. It was very difficult to pretend that I liked a murderer, a man who forces himself on women, a maniac. But I had no choice. He kept asking me if I loved him and I said yes. I still don't know how. He didn't suspect anything. In April 1997, Komin took Arena out of the bunker and brought her to live with him in his flat. Now, I need to let you know what Komin's life was like on the outside. He was a very mundane character. He had no job, lived in a shared flat and claimed benefits. Neither his family or his friends had any idea what was going on. Then all of a sudden, he brings this young woman to live with him in the flat and then they get him married. Komin kept a constant presence around Arena, never allowing her a moment's peace. He monitored her communications, ensuring she maintained contact with family and friends under the pretense that all was well. He even seen to that Arena officially ended her relationship with her boyfriend. Then, one day, whilst walking together, the new couple bumped into Irina's parents. Komin came across well-mannered and insisted that they got together so they could get to know each other. They soon met at Irina's parents' house. Komin had a knife and he told her that if she did not play along with him, then he would murder her parents and then her. Whilst chatting with her parents, he asked them for their blessing to marry their daughter. Komin's manipulation did not end there. He also convinced her parents to give over custody of Irina's two-year-old daughter, who was being cared for by relatives. He made out that they were now going to be a happy family, but Irina recognized this for the manipulative tactic it was, effectively making her daughter another hostage in his sick game of control. But in this moment, she had no choice but to go along with it. She must have been raging inside. As the wedding got closer, Komin purchased a dress for Arena and they set a date for the ceremony. But fate intervened when Arena's grandfather passed away. Komin was superstitious and believed this to be a bad omen. So he decided to delay the wedding. All the while, Irina's desperation to escape grew, especially as Komin told her of his plans for the women in the bunker. Irina had been cooking food for the women and Komin would take it to them, but he told her one time to poison their food. He wanted rid of them, but Irina refused. His backup plan, however, was even worse. It was to bury the women alive by filling the bunker with earth and leaving them to suffocate. Irina needed to find a way out, and fast. Opportunity struck when Komin, who had undergone a small operation and needed to stay in hospital for a few hours, leaving Irina alone at home for the first time. Seizing the moment, on July 21st, 1997, Komin, preoccupied with his recovery, allowed Irina to take her daughter to the doctors 
by herself. This unprecedented level of trust presented Arena with the chance she had been waiting for. A chance to break free from the nightmare and save not only herself and her daughter, but also the women still trapped in the bunker. With the small sum of money left by Comin, Arena took her moment. She rushed to the bus stop. She was paranoid that she was being followed and that this was some kind of test. But she made her way directly to the police station. When she got there, she told the officers about the entire ordeal. But sadly, she was dismissed. Officers thought she made the entire thing up. They told her to stop watching so many horror films. Shocked but not defeated, Arena went to the criminal investigation department. There, she requested to speak with an old acquaintance. Once in their office, she saw photos of the captive women on a notice board for missing people. She told the officer about her harrowing ordeal and pointed to the photos of the missing women. This time, the officer believed her and ensured Arena and her daughter were in a place of safety and immediately dispatched a team to the garage. Comin was quickly apprehended. They located the bunker's entrance, but Comin continued to deny the accusations. Arena had warned the officers about the deadly voltage on the ladders at the entrance of the bunker, so the police officer threatened that if he were harmed, Comin would face charges for a police officer's murder. Comin then turned off the power supply, paving the way for the rescue of the women and the unraveling of Koming and Mikhaev's reign of terror. Upon exiting the bunker, the two women, Melenkova and Kuzikova, had to shield their eyes and cover their face and protect themselves upon entering daylight for the first time in over two years. Following the arrest, Komin admitted to the heinous acts but framed his actions as charitable. He claimed to provide shelter and food for those who had none. The case hit the headlines immediately and a wave of disbelief and horror fell over the people who thought they knew Alexander Komin. But they were confronted with the chilling reality that stood in stark contrast. His friends and neighbors struggled to comprehend how such an ordinary person could mask the truth of his hideous behavior. Mikhaev was also arrested and he took no responsibility for his actions. Professing love for his wife and children, Mikhaev painted himself as a reluctant participant forced into compliance by his fear of what Alexander might do to his loved ones, to which he claimed Komin had threatened. When Melenkova and Kuzikova publicly revealed their tattooed faces on television, local authorities set up bank accounts to fund tattoo removal, estimated to cost $400. Tragically, there were no donations reflecting a lack of empathy from the public. Some, even unjustly, blame the victims for what happened. In June 1999, the trial against Alexander Komin commenced. He received a life sentence, while Mikhaev was sentenced to 20 years. Komin never truly expressed remorse, saying his only regret was not marrying Irina and not carrying his plans through to the end. Just days after the sentencing, on July 15th, 1999, Komin ended everything in his cell by cutting a major artery in his groin. The aftermath for the women is perhaps the saddest part of this case for me. They were shunned from society and lived through particularly cruel hardship. The past haunted them wherever they went, they had no chance of employment and no chance at a normal life. Melenkova was particularly devastated by her experiences. She found herself unable to recover. She resorted to begging and scavenging for food in people's bins. She died only a few years after being released from the bunker and spent all that time on the streets. She was found lifeless amongst the rubbish she had been reduced to sit through 
for survival. However, although to begin with, Kuzikova also lived on the streets. By chance, a popular singer came across the story and now there was finally someone to help. Moved by her plight, the singer financed the tattoo removals, needed to remove the word slave off her face, and they also secured a home for Kuzikova, which helped her have a fighting chance at a normal life. But sadly, despite these efforts, Kuzikova passed away less than seven years after her release from the bunker. Irina did fare better. She managed to get a job and secure a home for herself and her daughter. Although it was very tough, she survived and now has a large family and is very loved. Mikhaev, after serving his sentence, was released in 2017 and retreated to a quiet life in Moscow. Insanely, a live TV debate brought Mikhaev face to face with Irina, where she publicly challenged his defense of being manipulated by Komin accusing him of lying and being just as culpable as him. She said he took pleasure out of the women's suffering. Mikiev passed away in 2020, and it's only Irana alive today who was part of those horrible crimes. But I'm glad she managed to find some happiness. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.